watching West Harford Community Television. You're watching West Harford Community Television. You're watching West Harford Community Television. For the community, by the community. Hi, and welcome back to another episode of Two Guys and a Lot of Wine. I'm Bobby P. And I'm James Kimbrough. And yet another great seasonal episode, warm weather, and an episode we're going to call Wines Under $10, that I think are going to both surprise us as well as you. And I think the excitement level is a little at a high level here, Jim, because I'm is. not sure what to it expect. Is. I know you have some surprises for me. I have some surprises for you, and whether or not those meet, in a cordial fashion, we will wait and see. <laughs> and uh, as usual, I just want to say uh, some of our fans out there in San Diego, Sandra and John Grant and Bill Kirsten, thanks for watching, thanks for your input, and uh, everything that you've suggested. Well, I haven't done, but I'm working on it. <laughs> and also, thanks to uh, West Harford Community Television for yet yeah, winning a very prestigious award, being the best small TV station in the nation. Uh, our congratulations to you guys and all the programs that are on this channel which make that possible. And you, the audience, who uh, watch our show. Yeah. Well, so thanks to, again. We hope to be a big part of them winning the award again next year. Absolutely. And speaking of awards, Jim, let's jump right in to see if we have some award-winning wines tonight. Well, this again, the theme is under $10. And you, know, you think back uh, 10, 15 years ago, if you tried to find a wine under $10, it was, a pretty, it was a pretty scary proposition. Yeah. yeah, there were not a whole lot of great wines under $10. Today, there are a lot. And we're going to try four of them tonight. And hopefully all of them will be thumbs up. Yeah, and I know the two that I brought, you have not had. So I'm very no. excited. I wish, I'm always excited to see if I can get Jim to not like something. <laughs> Just like he's trying to find if there's something I don't like. So tonight might be the night, guys. We'll have to wait and see. All right. Well, we're going to start off with a Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, this is my personal favorite. I serve this all the time when I entertain. This is the Casa Julia. And this comes from uh, Chile. And uh, let's give this a shot. Pour a couple of glasses here. And this one is available locally for anybody who's interested? Locally. Uh, I buy this at Super Cellars. Um, I believe it's also at Maximum Beverage. Um, it's great for entertaining because it's, it doesn't have a whole lot of notes that are going to be uh, harsh. Um, it appeals to a lot of different palates. Uh, so a lot of different people can get together and enjoy this together in a group environment. So it's, it's great for entertaining. And I see you brought your uh, spout that you talked about in the last show. You know, I figured we talked about it on the show. I might as well start incorporating it. Uh, Absolutely. And, and show people how it works. Now, it's fascinating. I already sense an aroma from this. From yeah, this yeah just, just from way down here. It just jumps right out at you. It's Which good. is a good, good uh, thing for a wine under $10 because automatically that's telling you that your palate might be surprised. Yep. Yeah, you get kind of a, a mandarin orange smell and uh, yeah, very citrusy. You sure do, right off the bat. Very citrusy, which is I generally like in a sovereign. That's, that's exactly what I look for. Here we go. Yep. Uh, definitely citrusy, but not in your face citrusy. No. Very mild, but at the same time, you know there's citrus here. There is some citrus. Um, you get some tropical notes, too. A little bit of kiwi. Um, very easy on the palate, though. This, this goes down very easy. Uh, this pairs well if you're barbecuing outside. Uh, you can do a lot of different seafood dishes with this. Uh, this will pair well with a, a spicy shrimp or Cajun blackened salmon or tilapia. Uh, this, this works very well. And normally, you know, when you do something spicy like that, I recommend serving a, a Riesling or a Gewürztraminer, a kind of a sweeter wine, 
Uh, but this this will work very well with spicy foods also. So. Um, yeah, you mentioned a Riesling we've talked about before. I don't think we've tasted a Riesling on the show. Not yet. on the show. And I, I think uh, for a future episode, we'll have to bring in a spicy dish and, and do a whole bunch of different Rieslings just to show how it how You it know what? Uh, well. We have this nice tablecloth. Why not put a little food in front of us while yeah, we're drinking our exactly. wine? Exactly. As long <laughs> as it doesn't interfere with the microphone. But uh, I must say, for an under $10 Sauvignon Blanc, um, very impressive. It's a great value. And I, I recommend this to everyone. Big thumbs up. Yeah, definitely a thumbs up on this one. And um, one of the other reasons I, I like this a lot is because it's actually warmed a little since it's been sitting here. And it still has a nice punch to it. Right. And it's still quite refreshing. And I know we've talked about in the past about the uh, actual temperatures of wine, especially white wine. Should it be cold? Should it be room temperature? Should it be just below cold? Or uh, whatever ideal temperature that some people think white wine should be. But this has been sitting, I think, perfectly, and it's uh, really good. Yeah, if you get a, a white wine too cold, it kind of kills all the flavors. Yes. And so then you're just drinking cold water at, at that point. I mean, it's, uh, you, it'll have, still have the alcohol in it, obviously, but uh, there's, there's very f little flavor if you get it too chilly. That's important to talk about because I know, uh, I think Tony on our show last time talked about the same thing, is when white wine d is too cold, you lose so much of the characteristic mm -hmm. of the grape. And you know, part of the reason we do this show is because we want you to taste the grape. We want you to taste the different varietals. And I think letting these wines, especially the white wines, obviously sit a little longer out without them being chilled gives you the characteristics that you're looking for in the wine. And um, Yeah, the, I, I, just to go back, and I know I mentioned this on a lot of shows, I store my white wines at 48 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and I try and serve them almost immediately uh, so they stay right in that temperature range. If you put them in a regular refrigerator, they're going to get even colder. Uh, I think that's around 36 degrees Fahrenheit. And for some whites, that's too cold. Um, you know, we talked about Pinot Grigios on the mm -hmm. last episode. And for Pinot Grigio, usually they don't have any flavor to begin with. So you can get it a lot colder and not really harm the fruit in the, in the glass. Um, but with this, you know, this, this was at 48 degrees and uh, brought it over here to the studio. So it did warm a little bit. I got to say, I'm very oh, impressed. And I've had a lot of Chilean wines. Um, and uh, in general, I think I've liked most of them. But for white, this is definitely going to... Uh, especially for that price point, because when you're drinking this, it definitely tastes like a more expensive white. It, it really does. And I'll be honest, to, to go back to what you were saying about Chile, uh, I've had a lot of Chilean wines, and I've never been disappointed. It seems like everything they produce is just phenomenal. Well, once again, thumbs up on the Casa Giulio. Look for that one, try it, and uh, feel free to respond to our webpage or Facebook page. Let us know what you think, too. Now comes the interesting part of my wine for Jim. I'm surprised. very excited about this. It's a different grape varietal. I'm not overly familiar with it. I've tried it. I really enjoy it. I'm not trying to jade your opinion on this. This is a Spanish Vina Gourmaz, and it's a 70% Varejo and a 30% Vura grape. And we'll talk about that more later on. And from my experience with this wine, which has only been, I would probably say, for the last month, it's not a Sauvignon Blanc type of wine, mm -hmm. but it's still, in my opinion, a spring and summer wine. And we're going to find out if Jim thinks the same All thing. All right, let's do it. And there's... And these are grape varietals that you don't hear about very often you here do in the not. United States. Uh, the 30% Vura grape is actually the most common grape that's planted in Spain. And it's usually used as a blend with other uh, Spanish wines, especially Tempranillo. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times that's used to make some of the premier, um, I believe it's, yeah, the premier red Rioja, Riojas that I know yep. you like. And now see, I'm not getting an aroma like I did no. with the other one from here. And, and very little when I bring it up to my nose. Yep, very small bouquet. It's not overly dramatic. It's subtle. It's a straw yellow color. I think it's a little bit uh, darker than the uh, Casa Julia. It's a little weak, and I honestly, we probably should have tried this one first. I, I feel like the Casa Julia was, is so overpowering. I'm still tasting a little bit of that. And uh, this, one's, this one's kind of fighting with the Casa Julia remnants in my mouth. From my experience with this one, and once again, you can try this yourself, and once again, these are also available locally. I think this one was from Liquor Depot, both in Avon and uh, New Britain. The longer this actually sits out, 
and develops more of a room temperature characteristic, I think the more open this becomes. This is still relatively chilled a little bit. We might go back to this one later in the show. Uh, sure, um, we can try it again. I, I get a little bit of a smoky taste at the end of this. Some of the tasting notes that I looked into on this wine, um, they seem to think that the longer it sits, it does open up mm -hmm. more. And it's not best to drink cold right out of the bottle. And uh, the Bodegas Gourmaz has been in operation since 1972. I think they have about 1,300 acres. And um, they produce some of uh, high quality wines out of Spain. And uh, once again, feel free to uh, look that up and do some research on your own before you buy it. Just in case you're interested about the history of the vineyard, I know we've talked about vineyards in the past. Um, a lot of times if you do some research and look into the vineyard before you actually buy the wine, or if you went to a tasting and tried the wine, do some research, find out a little bit about the, uh, the characteristics of the uh, country and actually where the vineyard is. And I believe this, this particular vineyard is on a very high elevation, mm -hmm. which is gonna make some differences in the taste of the grape too. Yeah, and if, if you're residing here in Connecticut and you don't get out of the country, uh, you can tour vineyards here in Connecticut. I'm going to plug the wine trail again. We've done this on several shows, but it's, it's a great way to get out and experience the whole winemaking operation. And you can see how you know, the terroir starts to come into play with a lot of these vineyards. Uh, you, you'll taste some wines here in Connecticut that, that are dramatically different from you know, one region to the other. Absolutely. And Connecticut's a very small state, and you, you still get some differences here. So With the elevations and everything exactly. else like that. Yeah. Oh, and one other thing about the Vino Gramaz is uh, the grapes in this particular wine are harvested at night. So um, they're generally at a cooler temperature when they bring them into the cellar, which means less oxidation. So we'll see if we can notice anything as that sits a little longer during the show. We'll come back to that later. And, uh, Why don't you pour me time. a little more? And sure. I'll just let that sit. Let that one sit because we're going to go to our reds in a moment anyways. A lot of people still drink whites too fast because they think they have to drink them cold. So I think this show is a good way to get people to start thinking that, you know, let the whites sit out a little bit and don't keep them overly chilled in a, like an ice bucket or something like that. Well, now you're completely contradicting what we said on the last show. Oh. We had summer sipping wines on our last episode, and we were trying to get wines very cold. Oh, that's true. If oh. you're sitting out in the sun. Well, that's and the Pinot Grigios. That, and that was the Pinot Grigios, yes. But I, well, you know, Jim, you, you, he makes an interesting point, because in general, a lot of people like their whites cold. But if they're too cold, you lose some of the flavor. Exactly. You don't want to get it too cold. You want to, have, you want to serve the wine at the appropriate temperature. So here's where, as you've said in the past, drink what you like and buy what you like or yeah. drink what you like. Some people are probably just so used to drinking white wines at a cold temperature. As soon as it gets a little to a temperature they're not comfortable with, they just might dismiss it right off the bat. Right. Or they throw an ice cube in it. I throw an ice cube in yeah. it. Don't do that. Yeah. That's, but actually, you know, if you want to do that, that's... Uh, I've seen so many people do that and it, it breaks my heart. They're, they're watering down a great wine. But and I'm going to tell you one little secret about that at the end of the show, which is going to shock you. But, All right. We'll uh, come we'll back to that Let that sit. One. And uh, I'm excited about our first red. All right, this is the Hemispherio Carmenere. Now, Carmenere is a grape varietal you don't encounter very often here in the United States. I don't believe I'm overly familiar with it either. This was actually, this is considered the grandfather of the Cabernet Sauvignon and the Merlot grape. And if you go back to the Bordeaux region of France, uh, back up until 1860, this was the predominant grape varietal that they grew. And then there was a, a Paloxera virus that came and just wiped out a lot of the vineyards. And suddenly the winemakers had to switch to a different varietal. And they switched to Merlot and they switched to Cab. And Carmenier just kind of disappeared. Uh, fortunately, the Chileans were growing it. They had been growing it since the 1600s. So they preserved the grape. Um, but if you, add, if you would ask them what they were growing, they said, oh, we're growing Merlot. The Carmenier grape and the Merlot grape are so similar in appearance and the, uh, especially the uh, leaf on the vine looks almost identical. So they thought up until about 20 years ago that they were growing Merlot. And someone finally came in and did some DNA testing and said, no, this isn't uh, Merlot, it's actually Carmenere. So it's... That is fascinating. I, it's, I, that I is love fascinating. little tidbits about wine history. That like is that. a great little history lesson for me, and I'm very excited to try this because... This, I'm going into this as a virgin, Jim. All right. Well, let's give this a shot. Again, this is, you know, this is what the Europeans drank up until 1860. Beautiful color right off the bat. It's a very deep color, uh, kind of a cherry color. Absolutely. Go ahead and give that a swirl. You'll see this has phenomenal legs. It does. I can see them slowly dripping down the glass. That's always exciting to me. Hmm. Very interesting aroma. Yeah, you get uh, 
just like with Merlot, uh, you get kind of a meaty, uh, fruity kind of smell to it. And then there's a hint of cedar, which is uh, what you'd get from a, a Cabernet Sauvignon. Yep. But this is all Carmenere. And once again, you would recommend this on a summer day? or Oh, absolutely, yeah. Well, here yeah. we go. Delicious. It's, it is. I, Absolutely delicious. I would describe this as being elegant on the palate. I mean, it's, it's, it's almost seducing your mouth. It's, uh, it kind of slowly works its way all the way across the whole spectrum of your, your tongue. And I'm still tasting it now. It's got such a long, smooth finish. This is why people like me and Jim get excited, because <laughs> it's, it's really it's love making in a glass. And when it's the right wine, it really is quite spectacular. Now, once again, we're talking about wines under $10. So this is another example of how a wine under $10 can just be so both elegant and uh, smooth, yet have a lot of characteristics in your mouth. Right. And I, you know, I've gone to tastings and, and had $40, $50 wines, sometimes $80 wines, and they've been horrible. And maybe there's somebody out there who loves the wine and agrees with, it agrees with their palate, but it doesn't agree with mine. And for 10 bucks to get something that just does so many different things in your mouth, this is such a great deal and, and a great way to experience uh, what people who, who do this for a living are experiencing when they're, they're tasting $100 bottles. And once again, I mean, it's another example of the variety of wines that are out there for you to try. Um, and this is a classic example that you might have just, some people just would walk right past because they're not familiar with right. what it is. Right. They don't know Carmenere. They've never heard of it. Uh, they would either think it, maybe it's too sweet, they're not familiar with it at all, what the type of grape it is or mm -hmm. nothing, and just walk right past. And you would be passing up something quite spectacular. And I'd tell you right now, if you serve this to your friends at any cookout or any uh, dinner, they would not believe the price point. No. And I would recommend no, not they, telling them the price point until yeah. well into the evening. Right, exactly. Make a game out of it. Don't let them get their predispositions up early in the evening. Yeah, this, and this wine, they've actually aged this in French oak, which you would think would make the wine more expensive. Uh, normally, when you, when you use oak or then French oak, that just adds to the price point of the wine. Mm -hmm. But somehow, they've kept this under $10 and still managed to use French oak. And that kind of lends it uh, a kind of a toast flavor with, and a little bit of... Um, uh, a little bit of vanilla, not it's it's subtle. It is a subtle vanilla. I get the toast thing, but uh, it's just it's one of those wines that it, we've had wines on this show where I'm still tasting it right now. Mm -hmm. This one, it's subtle. It's still there, but it's not so much that it's like I need something else to uh, counteract the thing that's going on in my mouth. Um, yeah, this this drinks well on its own. Um, you could also pair this with pork or beef. Uh, it, it would go great with, with either of those meats. How were you exposed to this one? Did you just find this as a fluke? It's, it, yeah, I go to so many tastings and try so many wines, and this one just jumped out at me the moment I had it. I gotta say, it's, it's, it's really quite spectacular, and I don't use that term loosely. And when you're drinking as many wines as Jim and I have, at a lot of different price points, if, if we weren't doing this show under $10, and he had two surprise bottles and I had two surprise bottles, I would, I would put that probably in the $20 range, yeah. if, if not more. I, and I, I would pay 30 to 35 for this if I had to. Well, it's that good. After this wine, we're going to go into uh, uh, the reds that I tend to be more prone to, as those of you who have been watching the show. I still have sort of a French Bordeaux guy. And uh, whenever I can find a French Bordeaux at a price point under $10, um, I'm always excited. Now, whether or not Jim will be as excited as I was, we'll find out in a few moments. Because we do have some differences on French wines. I like the mineral, I like the terroir in, in the French soil. I like what it does to the French reds, uh, especially from the Bordeaux region. And uh, Jim sometimes does not always overly. Uh... A lot of those wines tend to be earthy. Mm -hmm. And I, like a typical American, I tend to gravitate towards wines that are more fruity. Um, so, and that's the difference between the American palate and the European that's palate. That's true. That's true. Why I developed this particular palate for French, I'm not exactly sure. Because it certainly was not the first wine I was exposed to when I got into wine almost 15, 16 years ago. I actually think it was, uh, I think Australian wine, I believe. It's been so long and so many bottles. Um, but uh, when I actually started finding good French wine, I just, uh, it's still one of my favorites. And uh, we're gonna get into that one right now when you're done. <laughs> well, you know, but, but what you're saying proves the point that there are, there's a wine out there for everyone. Everyone's palate is different, but there are so many wines out there. You're bound to sooner or later find the wine that is perfect for your palate. And 
if you found the French Bordeaux to be the best thing for your palate, go ahead and drink those. Yeah, you know, whether or not they are the best things for my palate, I do not know for sure because I'm still enjoying trying all the different varietals. This one we just had right now, um, phenomenal. And for our viewers out there, and I would strongly recommend doing this now that we've had quite a few shows under our belt. Um, when you see these wines that we're tasting, try to go out and get them you know, a few days beforehand and taste them with us. Um, they're usually up on our Facebook page or, uh, uh, yeah, they're, yeah, you should put them up on the Facebook yeah. page. Friend us on Facebook, you'll get all the updates on what we're going to drink for the next episode. Because that's uh, the best way to experience what we're doing absolutely. right here. Now, the, uh, the French Bordeaux that we'll get into in a moment um, is one of my favorites at the price point. It is Chateau Gazette Bordeaux. It's a 2008. And to find a 2008 Bordeaux in that price range, um, to me, is phenomenal. Um, once again, locally available. I think this was also from um, Liquor Depot in Avon. Um, they don't always have a lot of these in stock. It depends on you know how many they sold. Sometimes they're in, sometimes they're out. But this particular one has been one of my favorites this year. And um, I'm hoping that it will be one of Jim's, but no pressure, Jim. Let's give it a shot. Now, I've enjoyed everything we've had so far on the show. So. Yes, you have. Now, I could already, already see the color on this one is more like we had this comment last time. It's more of a bricky color. It is. It's a, there's a little more brown in this than the last wine we had. Which goes into Jim's thing about the more mineral soil aspects of, uh, even though that's not the case, it just makes some people think that that's the case. Exactly. That's the psychological connection. Good bouquet. Yeah, just on the nose, I'm getting kind of the, the earthy aroma off of this. Completely different tasting than uh, Carmier. It is, and I, I get some licorice in this. Mm -hmm. um, maybe a little uh, anise, which is oh, very close to, to licorice. A little bit more stringent. Yep. You can still, that, that's a good characteristic when you're drinking or you're trying to compare red wines. This wine, smooth. The, ca the Casimir? Or uh, Carmenere. Carmenere, smooth, subtle, it's sort of massage the palate. This one attacks it a little bit more. A little bit, but it's not harsh. Not I mean, harsh. There, there are a lot of harsh wines out there, so I don't want you to think that what we're drinking right now is, is gonna be, have that nasty, harsh, yeah, attacking your mouth kind of to quality to it. It's, it's just when you compare it to the Carmenere, it's, yeah, there is a little bit of stinging going on. Yeah, there is, and I can still taste it in the back of my head. Yeah. I actually like that, but once again, for me, and the reason I brought this particular one in tonight, whenever I can find uh, a French Bordeaux at this price point, and there are some out there, but I wanted to bring something that I was familiar with, and I really particularly like this particular one. And um, whether or not you will, that's up to you. But I think for the price point to get a Bordeaux from 2008, I think it's pretty good. I completely agree. For, for $10 or under $10, mm -hmm. um, if you pair this with a cheese, it's going to mellow out uh, that slight astringent taste that you're talking about. And it's, as I drink more of this, I don't even taste that anymore. I think it was, you know, the, the remnants of the Carmenere made this seem so much more astringent. But now, as I drink more of this, I don't even get that quality anymore. Yeah, the second uh, sip, I don't get it quite as much either. But there's still a noticeable difference in flavor between the two. Yes. And whether or not it's negative or positive, that's up to your palate. But uh, I, I think, yeah, if you had a brie uh, cheese that you were serving with this or a goat cheese, this would be a phenomenal wine. And that's another important factor. I mean, so many of these reds, especially, go so good with cheeses. And, uh, you know, if you're going to have a bunch of people over, maybe your pre-dinner cocktail party or something like that, pairing these with a wide variety of cheeses, I think, mm -hmm. is a good way to start an evening. I know we've done it many times, and the evening has progressed to well into the late, early mornings. <laughs> but, um, well, but it's fun to sit down, like you do, with five or six different cheeses and taste the same wine with each cheese and see how it changes. You know, so cheeses have different qualities just like wines have different qualities. That's and, right. And so you're trying to find the perfect marriage between the wine you're drinking and the cheese. And so, you know, sometimes you want a really creamy cheese and other times you want something that's, uh, you know, more like a Parmesan or, um, you know, some, some kind of brick-like cheese that uh, you've know, you got to just cut it away with a knife. And I would recommend, you know, do some research on Bordeaux Frenches because uh, I've always been a big fan of Bordeaux's and... There's plenty of uh, research out there, plenty of um, places you can go to do research on French Bordeaux because there's so many varieties. And the price points can go from under $10 to into the hundreds of dollars. 
Um, so just take that in consideration. Yeah, but and the you know Bordeaux gets kind of confusing for the American drinker because you know Bordeaux is a region, and most Americans are are used to buying wine based on the wine varietal. So they you know they think okay I want a Cab or I want a Merlot. Uh, when they go to the wine store and they buy a French wine and they're buying Bordeaux. You know, they don't know which varietal they're getting. So that, that's going back to what you were saying. You have to do a little bit of research. That's true. And if, it was just like when Tony was on last, the last show about mm -hmm. Italian wines are the same. You're right. buying from a particular area of the country. And in that area of the country, there could be hundreds of small vineyards mm -hmm. that are producing either a Bordeaux or an Italian wine. So it's something else to look into if you really get, in, get into a serious wine buying or wine tasting uh, um, career like we have. <laughs> and uh, speaking of career... I think this particular little white wine that's been sitting for a while is ready to give us another shot back. to see right. if it's uh, opened up at all. And the name of this again for our viewers? Yes, this was the uh, Vino Gourmaz. It's uh, the Bordegas Gourmaz, and it is a 70% Briejo and a 30% Vura. And once again, it's the best way to characterize it is it's not as strong as a Sauvignon Blanc, but it has the characteristics of not a Pinot Grigio. Oh no, it's got it's got a lot more body. It's got a lot, a lot more, more body. Than a Pinot Grigio. You'd have to try it on your own and think, uh, make your own opinions as to what you think it tastes like. But I actually like this one a lot. And the grape originated in North Africa and was spread to Spain, I think, in around the 11th century. Um, so it's a very old grape. It is an old grape, even though you haven't heard of it here in the United States. It's been around. I, haven't, I don't really sense it opening up that much more. So what I, I'm going to do with this one, I'm going to say it's still a good white for the price point. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I like it a lot better now that we had the Bordeaux. So if, yeah. And this is, this is odd because usually you're supposed to drink whites before reds. In this case, I would drink the Bordeaux before the white. You Spain. know, I think because they're all in the range where they're not right in your face overpowering. Mm -hmm. So pretty much everything we drank tonight is subtle. So there's nothing that jumps right out, right out at you and smacks you in the face a few times. All these wines just sort of massage and slowly build up or slowly caress you. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm speaking like a wine lover, <laughs> but uh, they're all good. So that's the best way I can explain it. And um, I'm going to still give it a thumbs up because yeah. the last month I've been enjoying this and uh, I'm going to give it a thumbs up. I'm going to give this a thumbs up also. Uh, everything we've had tonight, thumbs up. Four great wines, all under 10 bucks. All under 10 bucks, you cannot it. go wrong. No. And I, I must give a plug to this bottle right here, which you might be seeing is empty. This was going to originally be one of the ones that I was tasting, but me and my lovely wife, Carrie, were out for dinner having a nice Cobb salad, eggplant pizza, and this bottle that I originally had planned for bringing on the show was consumed very quickly, and it was phenomenal. It is also a Bordeaux, it is also under $10. It is the um, Chateau Thomas Laurent. It is available locally. And I'm going to call this off the grid. So look for this on your own. We didn't get a chance to taste it together. And that's under $10. This is under $10. Um, it's off the grid, but it's delicious. So next time you're out there, Jim, feel free I'll to, look for it. to look for it. And, you know, we're just about ready to wrap up yet another fantastic show on wine. And uh, I once, just want to, well, I want yeah. to remind everybody, friend us on Facebook or like us or uh, share us with your friends. There's a lot of different ways to, to go out and recommend us on Facebook. Also, if you want to watch previous episodes of our show, you can go to whctv.org or you can go to youtube.com. And once again, Jim, cheers. Cheers. I'm Bobby P. And I'm James Kimbrough. And until next time, keep us in, in your, your wine, wine cellar. cellar.